bringing you key insights, tips, and advice from the brightest minds in the Canadian franchising industry. This is the Franchise Canada Chats Podcast. Hi, and welcome to the Franchise Canada Chats Podcast. I'm your co-host, Kristen. Hi, I'm Trisha. In today's episode, Trisha and I had a really interesting conversation with Matt Crowell. Matt is the founder and CEO of Get In The Loop, a mobile marketing franchise. Since starting in 2013, Matt and the team has helped thousands of local business owners grow across North America. Matt shared with us the number one tip he has for people afraid of starting their own business, the qualities you should look for in a franchisor, how you should measure success as a franchisee, and a whole lot more. And before we start the episode, don't forget to subscribe and share it with your friends, peers, and colleagues, and whoever. Let's jump right in. Hi, Matt. How are you doing? Doing well on yourself. <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. So let's dive right in. What is Get in the Loop? Yeah, so Get in the Loop is a marketing tool that uh, enables small business to create offers, promotions, unique events, and reach out to the Get in the Loop app and community to attract new customers. So we thought there was a real big need for businesses to be able to grow their customer base because the newspaper doesn't work anymore, or the radio is really expensive, and so we created Get in the Loop as a channel for businesses to communicate. And for users, it's a free app where they download it, they can register, um, they tell us what they're interested in. They never have to pre-buy or purchase anything. They get all these great offers and unique experiences right on their phones, and they show up to businesses. So our whole mandate is about connecting local businesses and giving them a voice in their community. Mm -hmm. And then the Get in the Loop local franchise is the ones that go out there and actually make all that happen in each community. Cool. And when did you start getting the Loop? Um, so it started in 2013, so I initially started it by just texting out uh, golf deals myself in Kelowna, and that's okay. grown quite a bit today, obviously. Awesome. Yeah. And did you find it hard to really get the word out, or has it kind of been a steady growth? Yeah, you know, um, early on it was a little easier in our own market, like mm -hmm. one city. Um, now when you try and become nationwide like we are in Canada, um, it, it's it's a challenge to get the word out. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've been fortunate enough, uh, we've been partnered with media companies in the past, and um, we've got a, a real good team that thinks creatively about how to get things out there. And so why did you get it started? Yeah, so well, it was kind of two reasons. One was I didn't have a job. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I used to, uh, I played uh, semi-fashional hockey in Europe. Okay. That's uh, probably the best way to put it. And uh, when I came home, I was trying to look for a different opportunity. Yeah. Um, and there was a huge need in our city for golf courses to connect with local consumers. So we have all these great golf courses that really made all their money in like six weeks in the summer. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, well, if they could get in touch with us when it rains or it snows or different things, we would, or not snow, but rains or it's too hot, um, that would be really unique. And so we created the golf loop. And uh, initially I created a text message platform mm -hmm. that would allow golf courses to log in and text out to locals, like come on in this afternoon for this rate. Mm -hmm. um, and it started to work really well. And then we turned it into apps and all of that. Cool. I said you were professional, semi-professional hockey player. Did yeah. you, before going to Europe, were you in the OHL or anything like um, that? So I actually played down in uh, NCAA, so I had a Division One scholarship to Rochester Institute of Technology just across the border here, and, oh, and okay. just, yeah, and so I was fortunate enough to get to do that, and then I played uh, two years in Holland, but wow. I actually lived in Belgium, just outside of Antwerp, um, so we were the only Belgian team that played in the Dutch Elite League, they called it, but <laughs> elite, elite is, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call it. Why did you decide to come back to Canada after a year? Europe? Yeah, well, um, it was so amazing over there and playing hockey, obviously, mm -hmm. and getting paid to play hockey is a nice thing, but it wasn't going to be retirement money. And I'd seen so many friends that uh, played until they were 35 or 40, and then when you come home, you have a really tough time getting into your career and adjusting. And so mm -hmm. as much fun as I was having, and I could have done it for a lot longer, it was like it was time to kind of get started and yeah. kick mm -hmm. life off and learn in other ways. I played yeah. hockey my whole life. Yeah. So. Yeah. so is that why you went? You turned from hockey to franchising, you came back to Canada and thought, you know what, I'm just going to start my own business and actually get my life, have a future ahead, because hockey can be kind of, yeah. you never know. Yeah, yeah, it was, you know, even when I started getting the loop, it was just meant to be a, a really fun local project in Kelowna to help the small businesses there mm -hmm. and the golf courses, and, mm -hmm. and then we started to partner with media companies and we grew, and we, we only really decided to franchise about a year ago, um, mm -hmm. and we're like, well, one thing that we found was that having an entrepreneur in each market made it very successful. But also local businesses want to do business with a local business owner. Mm -hmm. There's a huge trend of supporting another local business. And so we didn't want to be seen as a, a digital app media company that didn't have a local presence. And that's when we decided that franchising the local rights was a really neat fit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did you have any um, business background to do this? Or you kind of just moved right in? 
Well, yeah, I mean, I've been I've been really lucky. Like, I've had so many advisors and mentors over the last five years. So mm-hmm. the, the neat thing when you're in a technology company is if you start to grow really quickly, it attracts a lot of talent that are interested in helping you. So I've been fortunate enough to be advised by so many great people. So my, my knowledge of business has grown a lot in the last five mm-hmm. years. And then um, one of my investors was actually the head of growth for Remax in Western Canada. And then he was the head of growth in North America. And then he was head of global expansion, vice president of global expansion. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he did that for about 20 years. Mm-hmm. And so he advised me a lot on how to franchise, how to go to market, even our model, and, and still works actively in the business today. His name's Cliff Shillington. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, we our team has all the hustle and ideas, but we, we leverage a lot of experience and great advisory network that helps us out to make sure we're doing the right things. Mm-hmm. That's good to have. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty good to have. Yeah. What's like the biggest piece of advice that I guess he's told you or any of your... Um, you know, I think I think it was so many pieces of advice, yeah. but I, I think the, the real thing was... The one thing that was important to me was when you decide to franchise that every entrepreneur that, that signs up to be a part of our company today, like it, we view them as family. Mm-hmm. Um, they're making an investment in us, and it's our job to do the same. And and uh, and Cliff has just he he enjoyed being in franchising so much because he's seen so many people's careers take off through it. And and so he 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 really spoke about how passionate he was about the opportunity to empower entrepreneurs and change their lives. And and that's something our whole team is sort of embodied and is like this isn't a, we're not just selling them franchises we're we're bringing in business partners and we have an opportunity to change their lives as well and that's mm-hmm. that's something we really focus on mm-hmm. was he the one you said his name was Cliff yeah was he the one who said yeah let's franchise this business so that's a really funny story <laughs> um so when we decided to franchise our company was growing on its own we had our own sales team we were we went corporately into 35 markets on our own and um, and I, I said, I think I'm going to franchise the company. And I didn't tell anybody in our company too much. And I was just working with a few members on the side. And I, my whole thing was I didn't want to distract everybody. And so I was like, I'm going to put together the model and I'm going to do the research. And I even built the website you still see today, Getting Loop Local. And I'm not a web developer, but it was more to make sure I didn't distract our team. We have lots of developers. Um, and when I was talking to some of our investors, Cliff actually said to me, hey, I'd love to help advise you on this. And, and to my knowledge at the time, he was the local Remax owner. And that was it. And so I was like, eh, I'll let you know. Sort of like, just because you've owned a franchise, I don't know if that'll help me so much. And, yeah. Yeah. and about two months later, he we were out for a glass of wine, and he's like, hey, how's, how's franchising coming? And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm getting pretty close to what I think I want to do. We're just getting a lawyer involved in the paperwork. And he's like, if you ever want any advice, let me know. And I was like, I'll keep you posted. And uh, it was about a month later, we were out again and talking about it. And he brought up, he's like, are you going to master franchise? And I said, yeah, we're thinking of it. And, and he was like, you know, when you go to these countries, make sure, here's some mistakes I made. And I said, what do you mean? mistakes you made and he's like I don't know if you know my background and he's like I was the most successful young franchise owner in Remax in Western Canada and I sold it and they made me head of Western Canada and then he goes then they made me vice president of North America and then they made me vice president of global expansion and we went into 30 countries and he goes then I retired and bought the local Kelowna Remax <laughs> and, and so I was sitting there like with my foot in my mouth you know, like well would you like to advise me yeah. uh, um, you know and so uh, yeah. yeah so he wasn't the one that it led us down the path to franchise but uh, we kind of ripped up all my ideas and went with what Cliff thought was the right thing to do and uh, it's worked out pretty well are you expanding uh, internationally yeah we are so we um we've been really fortunate like we since we announced franchising we've had i think it's now close to about 12 different countries asked to buy master franchises we've got over 30 states that would like to look at how they how we bring it down there like mm-hmm. in the united states different various states and so um we want to make sure that we launch the remainder of ontario and eastern canada because we're pretty much everywhere in western canada um but we will be looking to go international this year um, but for us, we got to make sure we take every step, uh, one step at a time, and find the right people. So we'll, mm-hmm. we're not in a rush to do that, mm-hmm. but we've got a lot of opportunity to do it. And mm-hmm. in our in our model, it's sort of unique because you can open markets very quickly because it's all digital. So right. uh, it's not about how do you get more real estate built and all of that stuff. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it sounds like this business can go to any market really in the world. We've talked to other mm-hmm. uh, franchises whose their business concept won't apply to people in Italy, for example. So it sounds like you can easily expand with this. Yeah, I mean, it is. it is. I, there's, I think the whole world is going to be challenged in that businesses need a local voice in every market in the world. They need a way to communicate, and that's all changed. The paper, all those things have gone away for them. Yeah. Um, so that's something that's not going away, and, and mobile phones are definitely not going away, and that's kind of the bread and butter of our business. So mm-hmm. um, we're definitely very fortunate. Even the technology platform was built to be multilingual and all of that, yeah. so we could launch this in other countries, and it doesn't have to be English first. I mean, that's sort of a bit natural for us, but... Yeah. Yeah, we can definitely scale quite quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's all just about making sure the one thing we're learning a lot about franchising is everybody has to be successful. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we want to grow really fast, but we want to grow fast and successful. So yeah. smooth, smooth <laughs> is fast, right? So yeah, make yeah. sure we're doing a really good yeah. job. Yeah. Yeah. What's like the biggest challenge you're facing right now, I guess? 
Um, well, so that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I think some of the bigger challenges we have as a team is actually just finding great people, and mm-hmm. um, not from a franchise point of view. We've had uh, we've had over three thousand people apply to buy a franchise in the last five months. Wow. Um, so um, yeah, so there's a lot of interest, um, but it's actually making sure that we scale at the right pace. Like we're mm-hmm. trying to hire here in Toronto and um, even corporately, and just finding great people is a challenge for us. Um, and then and then making sure that we're not pushing too much on the gas. Um, we we have so much opportunity in our business. Um, the way we grow is actually by making sure we're really focused. Um, and so some of the challenges are making sure that we're focused and finding great people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and that would be some of the things we're looking at right now. And how do you find, like, how do you make sure, like, what's your top, uh, I guess, qualities of a good franchisee? Like, what? Yeah. Um, what for, for us, it's, it's really inter- it's It's all about attitude and, mm-hmm. and hustle. Um, if they have a great attitude, businesses will, will like them and believe in them mm-hmm. and will, and like that, everybody with a good attitude succeeds. Like I'm, I'm a true believer. If, if you believe in good things, good things will happen to you. So, um, everybody that we've sold a franchise to today is, uh, has got the most amazing attitude. Yeah. Um, and then they have to be willing to work hard and, and want, cause I think like in any business, you gotta be out there and willing to hustle. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the, the role is actually selling to local businesses, but surprisingly enough, you don't have to be an expert salesperson or be an expert in digital media. Um, we have groups that are farmers. Uh, we have local, like they, they, they were running a farm before, but they're very connected in their community. There's firefighters and like none of those folks have were, grew up in a sales background, right. um, but they have great attitudes. They understand business and they're locally connected. Like that's actually what uh, the skill sets we're looking for. Um, the product sells itself to some extent with where businesses are looking for a local voice and the price point to a small business is only $225 a month, which is very affordable advertising. So selling this to businesses isn't the challenge. It's uh, it's all about just finding people that have a great attitude and when we can train them on it. Is there like a particular age? Because I know people are always like, you know, younger people tend to be more like digital and more tech savvy and stuff like that. Is yeah, that it's, stereotype? It, it, it's funny. Everybody yeah. stereotypes it, yeah. uh, that we would be like a young person's franchise. Yeah. And it's quite the opposite. The average age in our franchisee network is over 45, oh, wow. for sure. Because um, one thing that's actually important is your connections and your network. Mm-hmm. And uh, young folks don't always have that. Um, you have to understand business and even understand the face of the challenges small business mm-hmm. face. So a lot of our franchise owners actually owned their own business in the past and were like, holy, uh, the reason <laughs> the reason I, I succeeded or didn't was because this was hard. Marketing was hard. Mm-hmm. And so they actually kind of, kind of understood what we were trying to achieve. So they were very interested mm-hmm. in that. So the age isn't that important. Um, we do have young uh, young business owners already, but um, the, the whole software, everything with technology today, if you have really good technology, what that really means is it's really simple to use, and and we believe we have good technology, and so everything we've done has been made it really simple for a business to market themselves, and then we're working harder and harder to make it really simple for a franchise owner to operate their business. So you can operate your whole franchise right from your phone, um, and, and we're going to make that easier and easier as time goes on. So you don't have to be super digital savvy, and, and your network's actually more important uh, than yeah. your age, that's mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess I'm like an older generation millennial, but also we don't see a huge amount of millennials that have a ton of hustle. <laughs> so, uh, I don't like oh, to, be st- not, not to be not to be stereotypical, but that would be our concern on the other yeah. side. Is like uh, it's not a frappuccino eating business. And I feel today. very it's, sad about that. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I'm one too. So no, no, I'm not saying it's you guys, but uh, you know that's a stereotype that we we always have to fight through. Like yeah. even when hiring in our team, we've got an amazing young team. But uh, to find really good, young, hardworking people that want to get out of bed and work harder than everybody else is, it's, they're, they're not, there's not a full sea of them out there today. Yeah. You can teach the digital part yeah. of it. You can't teach someone to be a work. Yeah. It's, yeah. 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 It's can't go through the three month, be a grinder. Yeah. Course, yeah. Right? <laughs> You've got to be a grinder already. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, what was your first day like, would you say, when you first started the business? Were you nervous? Did you make a bunch of mistakes? Yeah. So I mean, uh, so how I got the, I'll tell you two different stories on the first because there's kind of two inflection points of first day. So um, I, when I started the company, I started the whole thing in ten days. So I came up with the idea. I pitched some golf courses, and they were like, "Yeah, we'd like to do that." Um, I built an eight hundred dollar WordPress website. Um, we launched. The, I built the widget and technology. So in ten days, we kind of got it started. So for the first ten days, I was so focused on trying to just get it up and running. Um, I, I don't even know if I, I knew what I was doing. Um, but then once it was going, you have this, this weird amount of anxiety of like, am I doing the right things? H- how much should I be working? And um, I was very driven. So I think they're early on until you have structure and a full plan. You're, you're like a dog chasing a car. Like you're just doing everything, but you don't know if anything you're doing is right. right. Um, 
And then the second flexion point of like really getting going is when we raised our first investment. Um, we raised $100,000 to start to grow the company and I didn't spend $1 of it for four weeks. And I remember putting it in the bank and I was like sick to my stomach of like, what if I fail on this? Like, uh, and so those were, that was kind of another flexion point of like really starting to grow where I was like, you have to learn <laughs> what the right yeah. things are to do. But I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, until you get to the point that your business is structured and you have a plan and, and you have advisors and mentors to coach you, it's hard because you don't know if you're doing the right things. You care so much and I think you wake up all the time and go, am I doing the right thing saying, I'm willing to work 12 or 15 hours, but is 12 of those hours the wrong direction? Yeah. And because uh, mm -hmm. it's really hard in a new business yeah. to know what's right and what's working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, like did you hire people to help you in those first 10 days or was it you were just on your own? Oh no, so I, I, ran the, I ran the whole company for the first two years by myself um, off my phone. Um, I was actually working full time in business development bank doing commercial finance and running it on the side. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it started to go well, I quit my job, sold my condo, sold my car and invested all into the company wow. and, uh, wow. and decided to get going. So, um, so I was an entrepreneur, uh, kind of a one man show for a little while and then um, once we raised our first hundred thousand dollar investment, we started to hire a few people, and mm -hmm. and then it got a little easier and scaled in time. Mm -hmm. Was it nervous for people like your first employee you hired? Were they kind of hesitant because they were the first one, and were they excited because they saw potential in the business? Yeah, I think it was. You know, you, early on, people buy into the whole vision and dream, mm -hmm. and so you know, we weren't paying very much or anything at that point, really. Yeah. So they really had to believe in our future, and mm -hmm. so it kind of goes in time like as your business grows you're selling the dream and what they could be and then you're selling a bit of how they get compensated and what it could be and today it's like all about the compensation in the company and right. what's your office like and you know it, it's <laughs> yeah. very but early on it's like total smoke and mirrors like yeah, yeah. they got to believe because there's, you know, <laughs> there's not a whole lot there <laughs> right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well it obviously worked out for you because you you have like a ton of accolades uh, like marketer of the year and then you are also you're also 17th of 40 out of 40 profiles for Kelowna's top 40 under 40. So what's the key to your success? Yeah, I didn't know I was. Uh, um, well, <laughs> yeah, I think that was a few years ago. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I think it's really about the only thing I'm good at is I work really hard. Um, yeah, there's you know there's a lot of people smarter than me. There's a lot of better ideas. Um, I think I think work ethic is really important. Um, but really what that comes down to is the work ethic of our whole team. Like anytime you win even a personal award, it's uh, cause maybe I'm the face. Like there's so many people on our team that work mm -hmm. so hard for our company to succeed. And then mm -hmm. in cases like that, Matt wins 40 under 40, but it's, <laughs> it's really a team behind me yeah. and, or even marker of the year. That's, that's our whole company and everybody like, but the only thing that we're really good at is we work really hard and there's a lot of smart people there, but I think we pride ourselves a lot on our work ethic and how much we truly care about succeeding. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the things that um, you would, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs or future franchisors before they invest? What would you say to them about uh, finding success and doing a good job? Yeah, well, it's it's kind of twofold. Like, you, you, you would want to advise everybody that make sure you really know what you're getting into. Uh, make sure you understand what it's going to take. Um, you have all your questions answered. Mm -hmm. But then my other set of advice would be, like, you only get one shot. Um, like, you you only ever regret things you didn't try. You, you're like nobody looks back and goes I should like yeah you, you make mistakes but you never really regret your mistakes because you learn from them and so mm -hmm. um, I think people have a tar hard time jumping today mm -hmm. everybody sits on the fence way too long and so although you got to do all your due diligence it's like if you're already thinking you want to be an entrepreneur if you're sitting at home and saying oh I don't like my job like you only get one life move mm -hmm. like move people sit for years and sometimes decades saying I might become an entrepreneur mm -hmm. it's like become one and if, it, if you really suck at it then go back to working working is always available right? um, so <laughs> that would be sort of uh, the advice there and then mm -hmm. and then I think the other advice to French potential franchisees of ours and others is I think people really underestimate the effort it takes to get it off the ground um, it's like yes you can create this great lifestyle a huge income there's all these great things but that comes after churning a lot of, like a lot of hard work off the beginning and I think people come in and they picture the end and they think it starts like that and to get to where you're at the point where your business makes you a few hundred thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. and you're running it you know in control mm -hmm. um, that doesn't happen in the first uh, six months so get ready in any company it's uh, it's years of putting in the hard work to get to the point you want to be in it and just I've seen a lot of people where they start and they're already starting like they're 25 years into their company like you know and mm -hmm. you, you got to work so damn hard to get it off the ground yeah and that would even apply to franchisees you know because I think the thing is that people say it's a lot safer than, you know, starting your own business. Would you 
you yeah, say that? Yeah, I think it is. Like, you know, I'm sure there's, if you go buy a vending machine, maybe mm-hmm. you don't have to work any harder because that's only just putting the pot in. <laughs> um, but I think even if it's a restaurant you buy or something like that, your first hires are so important mm-hmm. and you're not going to be good at hiring and, mm-hmm. and, and you're going to need to learn to run the system and customer service. Like, you're going to have to work so hard for the first year and a yeah. half or two years to learn to get that core team in place. And, mm-hmm. and in our business, it's the same. I mean, you have to... You have to hit so many companies and, and you have to work really hard at the beginning. And then you do get to this point where you're really managing your business uh, community and you can do it all from your phone. And, and it will get to that point that you're making a lot of money and really out there networking and having fun. Mm-hmm. But early on, it's like it's so much work. And, and I don't think there's a franchise that uh, I, I don't think just because you buy into a system that that solves the need to really put in so much extra effort. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just out in Moncton this weekend and we talked to um, some some great entrepreneurs and franchisees. And, and one uh, young girl who was about 28 had... Uh, bought a Yuzu franchise and she was talking about it, it took her two and a half years um, of working seven days a week, 12 hours a day to, to now the point she moved away and as a manager. Yeah. But like she put in you know, five years worth of work and two years to get it there and that was a franchise and it's a system and uh, but it's, that's what it took to get it to the point of success. Right. And I mean, you also have some great advice for franchisees. I think any good franchisor is a leader, but above anything else, what would you say makes a good franchisor? Yeah. Um, well, we're pretty new to being franchisors, so I, I, I'm still trying to learn a lot from some of the greatest ones. I mean, I think the biggest thing is having a team that cares a lot about the franchisee's success. Um, and and maybe some franchisors don't look at it that way. It's more like, hey, they got to go and do it themselves. And, and although it's it's your responsibility when you buy a franchise to succeed, we really believe it's our responsibility to, to help make sure that works and to get everybody going. And I think a good franchisor really cares about the entrepreneurs that believe in them. I mean, to us, that's kind of at the core is make sure that every single person that invests in us, we're investing back into them and we're caring about the success. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if I can speak on too much of advice as what a good franchisor is. I'm trying to learn to be one. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, yeah. we're, we're doing our best, but yeah. uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people that know way more about being a good franchisor than me. And would you say that your franchisees, I guess they don't really have to have any uh, educational background. They just have to be passionate about services? Yeah, yeah, you just got to be passionate about the local business community, you want to be a connector and a networker. Um, you know, I, I have a lot of education and so, so do so many members of our team and we actually talk a lot about it as education means nothing to us. Um, it's Education teaches you to learn um, but it doesn't uh, doesn't make who you are and, and I think, uh, you know, when even when we get great students at a school on our team, it's like we then have to teach them to work. They're just smart people. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not, not putting down education, but to me it makes no difference on how successful you'll be in mm-hmm. life and, uh, just as a piece of paper. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. And so what kind of support do you offer to your franchisees? Because I think that's a big part of going yeah. to the um, system. We're, we're trying to be really unique with that. Uh, okay. It's probably one of our d- differentiators. So mm-hmm. um, we do Loop University, uh, which is, I think, some of the standard in franchising. So we bring everybody in for three days of training. It's called Loop University? Loop University, cool. yeah. <laughs> so, um, I was like, I want to go. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's, uh, it's a really cool thing. So we currently we've hosted the first few in, in Kelowna. So mm-hmm. we're currently launching about four franchises a month. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to get closer to 10 by May. So we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Um, but we bring everybody into Kelowna and we do three days of um, kind of grueling training, so to speak, of all things digital media, everything about the platform, how to run your business. And so our whole operations team does that. Mm-hmm. But it's more than just the, the grueling training. It's like it's networking. So every night we go out, everybody's learning. To, they meet our whole team. They meet each other. Um, and then after the three days of Loop University, we actually bring our team out into the market with them and we show them how to sell the businesses. We do strategic meetings with like chamber groups and downtown associations. So we actually come out to the market and ensure that they're, it's not like good luck. Uh, we come out and we show them uh, how we sell the companies and how to set up their business. Yeah. And so we work with them like that. And then after, we, we've created like a community of support. So we use like Slack and different communication tools so that the franchisees can all talk to each other what who's learning and our team jumps in. So we really want to kind of create this catalyst for intercommunication mm-hmm. so they can talk to anybody at our team at any time, all through digital communication channels. Um, and then we're going to be out to, to most of the markets every quarter as well. And so... We really view that uh, being out there and helping support and, and learning from them is a big part of what we want to do. And we've already got some that are succeeding so quickly that we're now going to put them into helping train others because they've obviously went to their market and it's always neat to, you know, we've got the firefighter group. They're going to look at training other firefighters are now looking at buying markets and they might go out and actually train them because right. why not have other firefighters training each other? Mm-hmm. And so a lot of our franchisees that have already got in are like, they know they're in on sort of the ground level with us. and. 
they're so into participating and helping and learning and we're a very open group so they can tell us what we could have done better and we're happy to adjust and I think we're doing a pretty good job so far but we really do put a lot of effort and time into making sure everybody knows what they're doing and how to run their business. Mm -hmm. And how many franchises do you have for them? So we've launched 17 so far. Um, we've sold uh, closer to 30, and then we sold our one master franchise. So that's um, we only started launching them at the end of September. So um, so it's uh, it's come out pretty quick, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you hear a lot of uh, franchise networks speak about the importance of having their franchisees communicate with one another because they can share ideas, they can talk about how they can grow their business. Um, Obviously, it sounds like you guys are helping your franchisees connect. And why do you think that that is important, especially for your business? Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's important on so many levels. I think when you become an entrepreneur, it's very lonely. Um, so everybody who buys a franchise from us, they go back and maybe they've got a business partner or two, but you're in your community and you're running your own business. So um, being an entrepreneur, although it's fun and exciting, it's a lonely place. So to have a community of other entrepreneurs is a, immediately a great thing. Um, and then the second part is, they can share in wins and learnings and what they're doing. So how are you getting more people to download the app? Or, hey, the, these brands have a marketing budget right now for this, so everybody should go out and talk to them because they're all sharing in the same kind of business in a new community so they can take advantage of what each other are learning, but then also to take advantage of having somebody to talk to when you're having a bad day. Um, so that's something I think people underestimate when you become an entrepreneur is like, <laughs> it is an absolute roller coaster. And we want them to be able to call each other and go, wow, I've been shut down by the last 10 companies. And, it's like, yeah, that's going to happen, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and so they need a place to actually talk to somebody about uh, the tough times or what's not going well. Mm -hmm. And our team's always there for that as well, but sometimes it's a lot easier to talk to somebody else who's going through the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's not only just to share in the wins, it's to share in the losses and have somebody there to communicate with and, and make sure that they're, uh, you know, everybody's, you're not, it's not lonely at the top yeah. as being an entrepreneur. <laughs> right. give, give them a place to chat. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. when you welcome your new franchisees, are you realistic with them and saying, Hey, these are some of the challenges you may face. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think we talked a little bit about the numbers. Um, selling franchises is not our problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not. You know, we we just went to a franchise show, and ninety percent of franchise um, ors are just trying to find somebody that would want or would fit for their business. Because mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I look at them, we're very lucky. Like a traditional franchise, you not only have to pay a franchise fee, you have to then put, take out 100000 for a lease and equipment and hire a team. and mm -hmm. So there's a lot more. It's hundreds of thousands of investment. And then you have to be somebody that maybe wants to serve pitas or food or fill a vending machine. And so in, in a lot of franchisors' cases, it's, it's actually just trying to find people that could fit. In ours, it's not. I mean, we have thousands of people that want to do this. Um, our whole job is finding the right people and setting the right expectations. Mm -hmm. And so um, we don't view it as really selling franchises. It's a dual interview. Make sure they know. And, mm -hmm. and we go into the details of what's the hard part of the business. Uh, what's the easy part? What's going to take off the start? Like, mm -hmm. are you comfortable walking into businesses? Uh, do you, are you comfortable making cold calls? If you're not, this isn't for you. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so we, we find the vetting process because it's so much easier. No matter what, when you go down as a franchisor in time, you're going to have people that uh, you want to be able to look them in the eye all the time and say, remember when we talked about this? Remember when we talked about that? We want to go through, here's what your whole life's going to look like as a franchisee of mm -hmm. getting the loop. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but that makes communication and the expectations going forward very, very clear mm -hmm. and simple. And, mm -hmm. and it also makes it easier to, to, to push one another and say, hey, we all talked about this. Now let's go. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned being realistic about the hard parts. What yeah. would you say the hard parts are of this business in particular? Yeah. So the hard part, um, well, like anything, it's getting it kicked off in your market and making sure people know about it. So we we spend a, a, a healthy portion of their franchise fee back into marketing in their community so that um, everybody knows about their business. Um, and then learning to walk in and talk to businesses, that's hard pending on how comfortable you are with it. Um, you could be so uncomfortable and that'll take you a few weeks or you could be the first day you walk in and you're good at it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second part of our business is growing an audience and making sure that people are using the app. Mm -hmm. And so they're all, everything in my business is hard. Those are the two things that, you know, getting used to walking in and talking to businesses and finding channels to grow a user base and make sure people know about the app, which again, we support them and work with them on. Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the hard parts of our business. Um, and then depending on who they are, it all depends on who the franchisee is. Maybe, maybe actually just, being comfortable talking about the whole digital landscape is the hard part for them because mm -hmm. it takes more than a week or two to be really good at our job. We don't want you to be good at just selling, getting a loop. We want you to know about what's the difference between getting a loop in Facebook? What's the difference between getting a loop in Google? Mm -hmm. um, what, what are the newspapers like? Um, why are we a differentiator and why is this a great fit? And so sometimes it takes, if you haven't been in digital media your whole life, we want you to become a digital media expert over the next six months to a year. And so that just takes time. You can't fix all that in the first few weeks. Mm -hmm. What's the easy part or the fun part about this business? Um, so the fun part would be 
what's your job is. So there's two things. Uh, your job in the community. So the fun part is that you're, and I'm not slagging on other franchises, but your job isn't going in and making sure a young team of 17 year olds is showing up today and serving food and different things. Like uh, your job is, you know, talking to businesses about building their community, and it's talking to businesses about their marketing, and you're 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 going business to business. You can work out of a coffee shop. So the flexibility that Get in the Loop Local gives an entrepreneur, I think, is such a fun part. You can run it from your phone, and you're just a building connector. And then the other fun part is the difference you make. So we were we've worked with hundreds, and now today it's thousands of, of companies. And watching and talking to a small business owner that was having trouble attracting new customers or different things and them saying, for $225 a month, it's like, I created a brunch off of this or I'm selling products I never did. I'm seeing new customers. My events are becoming popular. Like actually making a difference to another entrepreneur's business is, it's so uh, empowering and it makes everybody feel so like that's a great feeling. And so, again, I think that's a very big difference between us and other franchises is you may not get that delight of by serving somebody some food. But actually going into a business that you're working with and them saying, you've made a huge difference and it's giving us a local voice and this is a great thing. As a franchisee, that's an amazing thing. You're going, holy, okay, my business is helping other people because mm-hmm. consumers love it. Everybody loves to get great deals and get information and all of that. So the consumer side, everybody loves you anyways. It's a free app. Um, but seeing the difference you can make on businesses, that, mm-hmm. uh, that brings a lot of surprise and delight to a franchisee. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you measure success as a franchisee just by how much, I guess, Different, the difference you're making in other companies? Yeah, so you measure success. I mean, there's there's two ways. So yeah, how, how, how well is it working for all the businesses in your community mm-hmm. um, is one thing. And then obviously financial. So you you know the more businesses you sign up, the more you make. Mm-hmm. Um, so for us, the model is, is really simple. So um, if a franchisee signs up 50 companies in their area, they make $98,000 a year. If they sign up 100 companies, it's about 195, whatever that is. And the average franchisee could manage anywhere from 100 to 150 companies before they'd have to think about hiring and growing their team. So you can get up to making anywhere from 250 to $300,000 a year on a business right yeah. from your phone. Um, and so it's the, the numbers are pretty, it, the, the return on investment is really good yeah. if you consider it's $35,000 <laughs> franchise fee or 15,000 in a small market. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, I mean, you can, Everybody measures success financially if you're an entrepreneur, yeah. um, but then you know the next measure of success is is being able to look around and say I help 75 different companies in this area be more successful, and that's a pretty neat thing to do as well. How long would you say it would take if I invested in your franchise and I were to reach my 300,000 a year mark? Yeah. Um, how long would that be? Would you say? Well, that's all dependent on who you are, the market you're in, how connected you are. So, like we have examples of franchisees that made their money back in the first 90 days. We have ones that are four months in and they're already pacing to make 150 to 200 thousand a year, and, we're, and they're only four months into launching their business. So, you, could you get there in your first year? You definitely could, but I think you always have to be conservative and think of the long run. That'll take a few years to get there. Um, but we do have people already that are out there on pace to do that very, very quickly. That's awesome. And as a franchise or as an entrepreneur, what's the best thing? about being, you know, be in business for yourself? Yeah, so, well, uh, there's so many things. So our whole platform was built to, to help small business or business owners market themselves and measure their results. So that, when we did that, that was amazing because you were seeing how you're helping there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next thing is watching the energy of our franchisees when they show up to Loop University. And it's like, you know, it's one of the coolest things you could ever be a part of. You, you see we have six or eight or ten people coming into our head office and they're training and but they're not it's not training it's like it's a life-changing moment for them it's husband and wife couples it's friends it's groups and like they're all there saying we've invested to change our lives and do something different and like that gives you like the tingles when you when you talk to them all and we go through and go why did you do it we talk everybody introduced themselves and they tell that story and every morning when that happens at the first time at loop you it's like holy smokes like this is a this is an amazing story like uh, we're so happy that we get to help you build towards your dream um, so there's that part is really neat and then the last part is what entrepreneurs bring to your business. Um, Already we're adjusting on the fly and learning because they have greater ideas than we do and the whole thing we wanted was not only to give business a local voice in the community but to have an entrepreneur telling us how to operate in each community and 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 working through the challenges and the opportunities and so it, the, the, the coolest thing is we already have dozens and soon we'll have hundreds of entrepreneurs thinking about our business every day and giving us feedback like the learning you get from that and if you're willing to listen is tremendous and we're very willing to listen so um, having so many smart people think about our business is like an amazing thing
for us as a company. Even though you you just started franchising, have you already gotten some feedback and taken that into account? Oh yeah, definitely. So a lot of it was learning how they went and succeeded. So it would be okay. One franchisee went into the market and it was only Instagram to contact every business and booked so many meetings and is building her whole business off of chatting to them through Instagram. So wow. now we're going to have her roll that out to everybody else as an option because mm-hmm. um, naturally every small business owner runs their own Instagram. So if we talk to them through Instagram, that's a great way to get a hold of them and they're engaged. And so like there, there's interesting learnings on how did they go to market or who hosted a you know an event and it was successful. So um, a lot of it has been how are they succeeding and who's succeeding early and what did they do? Mm-hmm. There's been tons of learning on that already. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we're also looking at the training and, and so we adjust the training every time we do a team debrief of what could we have done differently. Um, and really a lot of that comes from them. They've been, we, we rate ourselves every training, they give us reviews. I mean, we've been rated very well on how we train them. But you, you learn as you go into the market of, we need to put this more into training. Because you go out there and go, ah, they didn't learn that. And we, we needed to teach that better. So every loop you is evolving. Every time we go to a market, we're evolving. Um, and a lot of it's based off the feedback they're giving us or the ideas. And, you know, they we really encourage our franchisees to think entrepreneurial about our company. So some of them are already buying more markets and different things. And so because they've been so successful so early. And so it's, uh, and that's a really neat thing. Because then they can start to really scale their business within our business. Right. Yeah. So what's your advice for anyone looking to become a franchisee, just in general? Do it. Yeah. Uh, that's the biggest thing. Like, do it. You yeah. know, um, I've even been at, uh, we've been at trade shows and talking, like, we're talking to dozens of entrepreneurs a week right now, or mm-hmm. hundreds a month. And uh, I'll, when I talk to somebody and they're like, yeah, I've been looking for two or three years and mm-hmm. nothing's right. And I want to say, like, if you have to look for more than six months and nothing's right, you're not ready. Like, jump. Like, find out. You won't know what's right unless you do it. Like, my, my whole advice, if you're looking to be a franchisee or, or start your own business or anything, is you have to get started. No matter what you think the hurdles are going to be now, there's 50 more that you don't even know about. And it doesn't matter. Get in and go. Like, the only way to learn is to be, uh, like, to swim, I think you got to be in the water. And, um, and I think uh, it's one thing that I think so many people sit in because there's such a huge change today. People want to be entrepreneurs. They want to control their income, their destiny, their time. Everybody wants that. But the only way to do it is to actually risk doing it. And so my whole thing would be like, jump. That doesn't, I'm not saying jump with us, but do it. Yeah. Like take the chance because every day you're not becoming a franchisee or an entrepreneur is, is another day you're missing the opportunity to learn and get better at it. Yeah. What's coming up for Get In The Loop? Yeah, um, so we're opening an office in Toronto. So I actually live here in Toronto now. So I moved out in October. So we have uh, a team of over 30 in Kelowna and an office there um, corporately. And then we're opening a corporate office in Toronto to help support the whole launch of all of Ontario and the East Coast. Um, So those are sort of some big things. So we'll be hiring a corporate team here and we're just rolling out all the Ontario markets um, and the East Coast markets. And then towards the end of the year, you'll start to see us uh, move our way into the States and potentially uh, another country or two. I don't think we'll be live in another country this year, but we have, we're have we already in a lot of discussions to sell a master franchise to lots of other countries, and we're open to that as long as it's the right fit and the right person. So I think you'll see quite a few strides happen in the next little while. Um, we, we, we have a lot of goals, a lot of big goals, and so we're trying to move as quickly as we can. How are you adjusting to Toronto? Other than the cold weather, uh, <laughs> holy smoke. So, it's freezing. Oh my gosh, it's, it's so cold, it's unbelievable. Um, <laughs> And yeah, so that is a huge adjustment. But learning the path, also a huge adjustment. <laughs> I feel like a lost ant in the anthill down there. Like you, can be in, under for, yeah. you can be under for 20 minutes and you pop up and all of a sudden you're in the same spot I looked. I'm like, I was a block over 20 minutes ago. Like, how did this happen? So that is an absolute nightmare for me. Um, but otherwise, I love it. Like the energy... Uh, I hate to say it because from Western Canada, we like, you know, it's like, oh, everybody in Toronto thinks that they're the center of the universe. But it is true. It is sort of the center of the universe. Like for us, this is where business happens. This is where strategic partnerships happen, opportunities. Um, so I'm so pumped to be living out here because the energy you get and I'm learning so much. Like there's so many fantastic entrepreneurs and people to learn from out here. And when you come from a smaller market like Kelowna, um, it's a really neat opportunity to kind of expand our horizons and really kind of look above the clouds at where you could go. And everybody in Toronto thinks big, dreams big, and that's sort of where we want to be. So I'm loving that part of it and uh, just got to get used to freezing for so many months. Yeah. Are you a Leafs fan yet? Oh, uh, well, you know, no, so I was, I'm an Oilers fan, what? Um, So which has made it quite easy to transition into being a Leafs fan this year because the Oilers are just brutal. Um, yeah, I am becoming a Leafs fan. I've been to a lot of games um, just through networking and different things. I've been invited to lots of games recently and it's sort of hard to not be a Leafs fan just because of how good they are this year. Like they're so skilled and talented. I, I'm sort of a bandwagon jumper. Like I'm a Pittsburgh fan, a Chicago fan. If you have good players, I'm a fan of 
your yeah. team. And the <laughs> Leafs have uh, one of the most talented teams I think I've seen ever. Um, but I'm also blown away by like the Leaf nationism. I had to become a Leafs fan here because people knew I was a hockey player, and generally I don't watch hockey at all. Like I'm not even su super interested in it, to be honest. Uh, I watch the Oilers a bit to see if McDavid scores. Um, but coming here, I actually started to watch games or even read about them in the morning because you can go to 10 meetings, you talk about the Leafs in 11 of them. Every single, like, no matter <laughs> who you're meeting with, unreal. they, they <laughs> want to talk about the Leafs. I was like, I better start listening or reading because like, we're going to talk about the Leafs in every single meeting. Uh, it's it's insane. Like I've never seen something like it. You're yeah. offended by the obnoxiousness of it? Wait till the playoffs. I know. It gets bad. It gets it bad. Well, and you know what? I, I really appreciate that I think about 104% of people in Toronto also think they know a lot about hockey too. So like, no matter who you chat to, they have a strong opinion that, that's in left or right field. It doesn't have to be right or wrong, but like, Everybody thinks they know. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody wants to talk about it. It's uh, it's really. I, I think it's hilarious. Um, it's it'd be great if you owned the Leafs. Like when you're every single person just loves it and talks about it all day. I'm sure it's hard to be a Maple Leaf because there's a lot of scrutiny. Like you have a bad five second shift and you have a bad month. Um, yeah. But uh, it's it's really funny. Like it. I can't believe how intense it is. Like I, I, it's it's hilarious to me yeah. how much everybody loves the Leafs. And, uh, but that's great. I mean, they're a great team, and I love hockey. But it's uh, it's overboard. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For yeah. Sure. All right. Um, all right. You're ready, are you ready to do some franchise fun? Yes. We'll, we'll ask you some questions. You fill in the blank. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, okay. Cool. All right. The most interesting thing I've done recently is. Oh, um, visited Moncton yesterday because I'd never been to the East Coast, and uh, why it was so interesting is that the people. Um, we're exactly lived up to the hype of the East Coast. Everybody was the most amazing, nice people, and every little pub or anything you went into was live music. It was sort of everything you could do. Yeah. The most important thing in life is? Um, enjoying the ride. You only get to live once. Make sure you're enjoying the journey every day. I like that. The hardest thing for me to do is? Uh, turn off of work. <laughs> um, I, I've worked probably 80 hours a week and think about my business the rest of the time. Uh, turning off of work is a challenge, uh, but uh, I try to do it. If I could change one thing. Oh, um, huh. that's a really tough one for me. Um, I, I don't really live in the what could you do differently world. I just live in it happens and you got to move forward. So um, if, I, if I could change one thing, uh, Toronto would have weather like Florida. <laughs> that's a good uh, question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that that's that, that'd be it. I'd live in a warmer place. Like I, I always wonder if like yeah, yeah. I, I wish Toronto had weather like Florida. I, I complain that. every year and I, it's like I know it's gonna happen I just, every year. So. Totally, <laughs> totally. You know it's coming but it still gets in the way. It's yeah. like a shock. <laughs> if I could meet anyone oh. any fictional um, Jim Pattison. Um, Jim Pattison. So we were a partner of the Pattison Broadcast Group and mm -hmm. so I've actually seen him a bunch because I've been in this corporate office but I didn't go into his office and uh, He's a, I think he's just a, he's an amazing philanthropist. He's from out west. I don't know if he's known out east, but uh, he's just built a huge company. And um, and everything I learn is that he's just such an inspirational guy and, and a great person. Uh, he's also a hard, hard ass entrepreneur too. But I'd like to meet Jim Pattison one day. The key to success is um, believing in what you're doing. You have to believe. Uh, if you don't believe, you won't succeed. Everybody says, "Oh, I don't know if this is going to work." I say, "You're right. If you don't think it's going to work, it won't." Um, you've got to believe. Believing is the most important thing. I'd like my friends to describe me as? Um, well, <laughs> a, a really nice guy that, that, that cares, but uh, they probably describe me as a busy guy that doesn't return their text. <laughs> uh, so I think I'm probably both. Despite having a mobile <laughs> marketing. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'd like them to say I'm a nice person. <laughs> my personal motto is? Um, oh, yeah. Well, it's... Uh, Hard work beats talent unless talent works out. The person who has had the most positive influence on me as a business person is? Oh, um, there'd be twofold. Uh, so positive influence would be a gentleman named Mark Payne. Um, so he's been my advisor and mentor for four or five years. Um, and uh, we're very involved in the company and he's, uh, he thinks a lot differently than I do. And so he's made a huge impact on who I am as an entrepreneur because um, he's an operational expert and a detailed guy and uh, so he's taught me a lot and probably made me think on the other half of my brain um, and then the second person would be my mom so my mom used to work three jobs put me through hockey uh, get up at four in the morning that sort of stuff when I was very young um, and that's been a huge impact of how I think about entrepreneurship so uh, you know no matter how hard I work or how hard it might be my mom was working harder and finally Canadian franchising is Amazing Canadian <laughs> franchising is yeah, yeah, it's an amazing thing. Yeah, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. 
Thank you so much, Matt. It was a pleasure having you. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to the Franchise Canada Chats podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. For more, head to FranchiseCanada.online.